Okay, welcome everybody. Um, you must have seen lots of sessions during the last two days here at .next in St. Petersburg. It is my first time and I really enjoy the conference. Uh, but just by show of hands, who is awake? Oh, not everybody. Okay, so I will try to get you awake during this talk. Um, once again, thanks for having me. Um, today I want to talk to you about building microservices using .NET Core and Docker. Uh, I've heard a lot of stuff around microservices already during the course of during the, uh, the conference, and I'm going to talk specifically about .NET Core and Docker, how they can help you as a developer to create microservices. Um, my name is Edwin van Wijk. I live in the Netherlands, and I work for a company called InfoSupport. Um, I'm also very proud to be a Microsoft MVP in the Visual Studio and Development Technologies category. Um, and today, like I said, I'm going to talk to you about microservices, and I'm going to do a lot of demos and code. I don't have lots of slides, uh, a little bit of, um, of theory, and then I go into, this into the demos. So, um, microservices. There are a lot of definitions out there. Uh, if you ask five developers what is a microservice, then you get different opinions and different definitions. So I wanted to set, the, um, set it straight how I look at microservices, because I think microservices are all about small autonomous services. And I've underlined autonomous here, because that's what, in my opinion, is the biggest thing with microservices. They need to be autonomous, and the size doesn't really matter. Um, also, microservices is not a silver bullet. If you start doing microservices, not all your problems that you have will disappear. You will actually gain some, as we will see in this presentation. Um, what is really important for microservices, in my opinion, is that you use your, um, the business that you're in to look at what kind of business domains and business capabilities do I need to support with my system. And we usually uh, talk about uh, domain-driven design, DDD, uh, to make sure that you have the right service boundaries defined within your microservices architecture. And that's the most important part. Not that, they're do that you're doing JSON or something like that. It is all about, do I have the right boundaries within my system? Um, most of the time, microservices should be good in one thing. They just have one responsibility. And um, that is also, if you look at the solid principles, that's also in there. So that's most of the time a good thing. And um, the more you can create services that are specialized in one thing, the more you can also isolate changes in your system and even failures in your system that, uh, that are uh, occurring when, they, when you're uh, at runtime. Um, the good thing when you do microservices is that you can start scaling your application in different ways. So you have the ability to scale your individual services differently based on the needs that you have. And that's a good thing. Also, we see more and more lightweight communication. Whereas for, formerly we did a lot of WCF, uh, SOAP, and big messages and stuff like that, we see more and more people going towards RESTful interfaces with JSON and stuff like that. And that is really nice, and it's quite often more performing than the other one, but you don't get a lot of stuff for free anymore. So you have to think about certain aspects like security and stuff like that when you do lightweight communication protocols. Um, another thing that you can start thinking about when you have a couple of microservices that cooperate to do something is talking about and thinking about event-driven and event-driven architectures. And in the talk today, I'm going to use events a lot to make sure that I can uh, create these autonomous microservices. Another thing that you have to think about is autonomy versus authority. Whereas in, in a traditional uh, application architecture, people are more often uh, thinking about one service or one system that, is, that owns certain data, for instance, customer data. And everybody that needed customer data had to go to that system to get the last version of the data. And in a microservices architecture, and when you start thinking about event-driven architectures, you can, a bit, uh, you can uh, go a bit more towards autonomy of the service by making sure that you um, ingest events that come from other systems. And then we will look at that in the demos, how you can do that. So that's a choice. Uh, and last but not least, if you start thinking about microservices and you're using microservices, um, you get eventual consistency for free. And that can be a blessing, but it can also be a burden. You have to think about it. And you have to think about those things in the design that you create. So um, that's very important. OK, um, so that is about setting the stage how I look at microservices. And there, there are lots of more characteristics that, uh, uh, that you uh, get to deal with with microservices, but these are the most important ones. Um, and then we start looking at .NET Core. Um, I think that the majority of you have already heard about .NET Core. I'm going to do a little 
small intro today. Um, but basically, .NET Core is a new version of .NET. And the nice thing about it is that it is cross-platform. So it runs on Windows, it runs on Linux, and it runs on Mac. Um, that is cool, but it, it's, in my opinion, not the biggest feature. But the biggest feature is also performance. It is way faster than the traditional .NET that we know. Um, and you have a very flexible deployment mechanism. You can put multiple versions of the .NET framework side by side, or the core framework side by side. So if you start looking at cloud or microservices architectures, this is very handy that you can have multiple versions side by side. Next to that, there's also lots of tooling. So you have Visual Studio, you have the Visual Studio code, but also a command line interface. And we will see that that is one of the things that will help you when you start thinking about working with .NET Core and Docker. So that's all I want to talk about now when it comes to .NET Core. Later in the demo, we will look at it some more. And then Docker. What is Docker? I think most of you will have heard about Docker and, and what it is. If you went to Sasha Goldstein's talk, he talked about um, all kinds of low-level stuff with containers. I'm not going to do that today. But basically, where my talks end today, his talks goes on about, OK, how am I going to do security and stuff like that when I start uh, um, leveraging uh, containers in production. And basically, always when I try to explain somebody what Docker is, it's basically what happens on the ship. So once we had a way of, uh, we have a standard way of creating containers and a way of putting them, on, stacking them, uh, them on top of each other on a ship, then we could ship things all over the world. And we know that once we get into a harbor, they know the size of the container. They can pick it off and put it on a trailer or something like that. Well, that's basically the main thing with software. We package software as an image, in this case, and we can create containers from that. And we're basically um, assured that when we have a Docker container somewhere, and we have a host that has Docker, uh, um, the Docker runtime on it, that we can run our, ex uh, our software there. So that's pretty cool. And this is mostly, mostly why I try to learn developers about Docker, because it is a great tool for getting your development environment uh, up and running on your machine. And that's basically what we will do today. Um, so containers are cool, but it's even more cool when you can connect containers to each other and create basically entire applications that work together as, as a whole. And a tool that you can use for that is Docker Compose, and that is what we're going to use extensively today. Um, if you then take another step forward and you think about orchestration and you, you want to go to the cloud and run something on an entire cluster of machines, then you start thinking about tools like Kubernetes or Docker Swarm or stuff like that. That is not what we're going to do today. So my talk ends at Docker Compose. Um, so without further ado, I would really like to show you what I have built. And I had lots of fun doing it. Um, so I created a sample application and made sure that .NET Core and Docker uh, just like you see here, they have a lot of fun together, so they help each other out. So um, what I did was I created a sample application. And this sample application is quite simple, because I wanted to have a domain that is simple enough to understand in a session like this, um, but is complex enough to, to do some funky stuff with, uh, uh, with integration, for instance, between several services. So I thought of a garage management system. This is just an auto shop that people bring in their vehicle, and this vehicle gets serviced. It's a simplified domain, as I said. And I've built it using .NET Core and ASP.NET Core. I've used microservices, DDD, event-driven, event sourcing even. So it's basically, for me, an application to start um, experimenting with these kinds of technologies and, and uh, methodologies. Um, I wanted to do event-driven, so I wanted to have a message broker. And my message broker to go to most of the time is RabbitMQ, so I incorporated that into the sample. Um, I use SQL Server as an RDBMS. And everything is containerized using Docker. And because uh, I'm using the Windows uh, of the Docker for Windows, the community edition on my Windows 10 machine, I can also run Linux containers. So I've done everything uh, with Linux. So first of all, like I said, it's very important to understand your domain. So before I started drawing services and buses and stuff like that, I wanted to create a context map. And this is basically what is in the application. So I need to be able to manage my customers, because I have to have people that come in with their vehicles, and they have to uh, get serviced, and then they can pay, and that's my business model. Next to that, I need to be able to register the vehicles that they bring in. And a customer can have multiple vehicles, of course. Um, but these are rather 
simple domains? Is it just basic CRUD functionality? You insert a customer, maybe this customer changes his address, but that's about it. So these are fairly simple domains. Um, this is a total different story, because this is where I make my money. So this is a more complex domain, and I've also used uh, DDD, for instance, and event sourcing to make sure that this domain is uh, um, uh, the core domain. Um, also, this is the one that I want to keep up and running 24-7, because if my customer management service, for instance, is down, I still want to be able to service the people that come in today. I might not be able to register a new customer, but an existing customer that already has an appointment needs to be able to service. So um, it's all about autonomy of this workshop management service. Next to that, I have an additional service to my customer. I want to send them notifications when uh, a vehicle is due for maintenance. So I send them an SMS or an email or whatever. This is also a service I want to keep up and running. So this is also an autonomous service. And last but not least, also very important when you want to make money, is invoicing. You want to send an invoice because else people won't going to pay. So um, I'm going to ask you to make sort of a mental note of this picture because it's not very complex. We have customers, vehicles, workshop management, and within the workshop management, is, um, a workshop planning is actually planning for a single day, and a single day can have, of course, multiple maintenance jobs for a certain customer with a certain vehicle. Notifications and invoicing, I think, is, um, speak for itself. So once I had this, uh, um, this picture, I thought about how is the logical architecture going to look like for this system. And I, um, I thought about this. I'm going to skip this one and go back to that later. This is a, the order was wrong. Um, so this is basically my um, application architecture. So I have a web application that's on top. It's over here. And it will use uh, three APIs the vehicle management API, the customer management API, and the workshop management API. And you see there's something weird going on with the workshop management API, because I see this as a single microservice, but it is actually two parts. It's an API part that I can use to give commands to the workshop management uh, service, and it's an event handler. And this event handler will start listening to messages that come from the message broker, and it fills up kind of a read model that I can use, and this database will actually store some data about a customer and about vehicles, so that when customer or maintenance, uh, customer management or vehicle management is offline, I can just keep operating. Um, in the bottom here, we have the invoicing service and the notification service. They don't have any APIs. They are just services that start listening on a port, and they just start listening to the message broker. And when a message comes in, they handle them. Um, the audit log service is a service that picks up all the messages that come over the message broker and store them somewhere. This is just for troubleshooting or for audit logging purposes. Um, and then there's an, uh, another nice service. It's the time service. And this is a very complex service. Um, what it does is when I start it, it looks at the current date. And when we roll over to another day, it just emits an event. Day has passed. And day has passed is, for instance, uh, a trigger for the notification service to see, oh, maybe there are people that have maintenance for today. Let's send them an in, uh, an, uh, a notification. So by making time a service in my architecture, I can now start testing things that are time-based very easily, and I don't have to start tinkering with system clocks and stuff like that. So that's a very nice uh, way of, uh, of thinking about that. So um, is this clear? Any questions about this so far? OK. Um, let's look at it then. So no more slides until we're nearly at the end. Um, first of all, uh, people in the back, you can read this? Yes? OK. So this is um, the solution that I created. So um, if we look back at the architecture, I have here the picture. Um, you will see that this, uh, all the components from this architecture are a project within this solution. So we have the audit log service, we have the customer management API, et cetera, et cetera. There is one strange one in there that is infrastructure. And infrastructure is a library that has some code that is being reused by several of the components, for instance, for talking to my RabbitMQ or it just abstracts away the message broker. Uh, it abstracts away sending emails and stuff like that. Um, and this um, library is built, and I've put it up into a MyGet repository. So all the other systems 
uh, get it through NuGet, so there are no interdependencies between the, the projects. And that is one of the lessons learned, because never make interdependencies between the projects, because that will bite you in the butt when you start talking with Docker. And I will show you later. So all these, um, these projects are autonomous, and they're just ASP.NET Core or just simple .NET Core applications. Um, I will come back to the solution later. First of all, I want to show you the application. So that's actually the functional demo. And this is where I start. So this is the web application. And what I have done, I have started the entire application on my laptop. So everything is running in containers on my laptop, Windows 10. And this is the web application. And for instance, when I go to customer management and I register a customer, So when I now say register this customer, what happens is that um, the customer is registered in the database. So we see it here, it came back. But also a message is being sent over the broker. Because the customer management API not only saves it to the database, but uh, it emits a customer registered event on the bus or on the message broker. And if we look at how the message broker has been set up, this is RabbitMQ. It's also running in a container on my machine. It works with exchanges and queues. And in this case, every message that I send from my application is sent to the pit stop exchange. And the pit stop exchange has been um, coupled to a couple of queues. And in this case, you will recognize the certain components in my architecture. So the audit log, the invoicing service, the notification service, and the workshop management service. So what did happen here? Well, in the back, these services picked up the event. So they said, hey, wait a minute, a customer register event. Do I need to do something with a customer register event? And for instance, the notification services, yes, I need to know what the telephone number and what the email address of a customer is. And then I have to go back a little bit in my presentation because I chose, like I said, authority over autonomy. So basically, the customer management service is still the system of record for customer data. That, that stays like that. Everything I do with a customer or change with a customer, I do through customer management. But other systems can just define their own customer management or customer registered event, but they only take these fields that they need. Yeah, so in this case, workshop management only needs to know the name and the telephone number of the customer. They don't need any more to do their job. So they just cherry pick the fields that they need. Same goes for the notification service and the invoicing service. And the whole idea here, if you start designing this, less is more. Yes, yeah, so um, the least fields that you can take, that's the best one. Because if you have uh, uh, um, a lot of fields that you use from other systems, then you get coupling. And if you went to Adam's talk this morning, um, he talked about coupling and microservices. And this is a choice that you have to take. It's a deliberate choice, but there's a price you have to pay for that because I am now coupled on certain fields. So keep this as low as possible. Yes? So if I look now in the database, for instance, and I look at the customer database, and I start. So I connect now with the SQL Server on my machine. SQL Server on Linux, in a Linux Docker container, on a Windows 10 machine. If we said that five years ago, people started throwing tomatoes, but it's possible now. Um, so what you see here is that in the customer management service, the customer has been registered. But in the workshop management, there's also a customer table with only those two fields, the name and the telephone number. And by ingesting these events, I just um, distribute this data through other systems. And every system needs to be able to determine whether or not they need to do something with an event. So the reader decides whether or not it needs the event, et cetera, for the notification and the invoicing service. So that is how the data has been um, stored in the read models of, the, uh, of these separate services. Uh, one thing that I can do now, for instance, I can uh, register a vehicle. I say, okay, it's... Uh, and it's my vehicle, I register it. And now I can start scheduling maintenance for vehicles. So for instance, um, between eight and 10, that was this morning, but bear with me, I'll have to change the tires of my vehicle. And this will be for the Volkswagen Tiguan with this 
um, with this uh, license plate. And the data that you see here, so the drop-down box with the, um, with the vehicles, it comes from the read model of the workshop management service. It doesn't call the customer management service. There's no um, request response between them. So basically, if I now drop down the customer management service, it still work. If I now register this, um, now also an event is being emitted workshop uh, maintenance job planned. And for instance, the notification service needs to know that. So um, another thing that I can show you, if I go to localhost 4000, um, here is an email server that I'm running. So this is an SMTP server, a test SMTP server. And every mail that I send through SMTP gets displayed in this, uh, in this UI. And the nice thing about being event-driven and using plain JSON as a message format, now I can send a message from my RabbitMQ for instance, and I say, okay, the message type, this is the protocol that I've, uh, that I've defined. Every message has a message type. In this case, a day has passed. It has, doesn't have any body. This is an empty body because uh, the intent of the message is enough. And now I publish this event. And what you see happening here, I get an email, which is a vehicle maintenance reminder. And mind you, this notification service can run on its own. If it's the only service that I start, together with SQL Server and, of course, the broker, then it can do its stuff. So that's pretty cool. And this is the email that got sent. Today you have maintenance. Change the tires on the vehicle with, well, et cetera, et cetera. You, you know what I'm talking about. So um, where is this running, this stuff? So this is the, the log that I received from um, Docker Compose. So I've started this stuff up, and now I'm going to stop the application to show you how this works. It's always SQL Server that takes the longest. And now everything is down. So it's not running on my machine anymore. And when I go to customer management, I will get an, uh, get an error. So how does this work? Well, basically, um, if you look at .NET Core, um, like I said, it has a, a, a command line interface. And the nice thing about a command line interface is that I can use that from Docker. Because I don't know if you have built your own Docker image any, before, but when I start uh, Visual Studio Code and create a Docker file, then I can describe how I want to my Docker file to be built. So I can say, for instance, from uh, Ubuntu, this is a, an image that I have already on my machine, and I want, to, um, um, I want to install something. So I can say run um, apt get update, and then apt get install uh, vim, for instance. That's not in the base image. So now I'm creating an, uh, a Docker file. I say, make an image that is based on the Ubuntu image. These get stacked on top of each other, and then run some command. And if I save this and go back to my, um, my console, and I say, Docker build, tag this image that you're going to create with the name test, for instance, and use the Docker file in the current folder. So the current folder will be my Docker environment. And it will start building this. It already has the Ubuntu image. If I don't have it on my machine, it will pull it down from the Docker registry automatically, and then it starts building on top of that. So it's going to get some stuff, et cetera, et cetera. But the idea behind it is that you, as a developer, can define how the Docker image should look and how the machine eventually should look when you run your container um, and what your application in it will look like. So that's pretty cool. And if I look, for instance, now at the customer management API, that is one of my services, I will just open that. And this is a basic ASP.NET Core web API application with entity framework. Nothing cool about that. It's just plain and simple. It's a CRUD application. Um, but it has a Docker file. And this Docker file describes how this image needs to be created. And if, if you went to the talk by Sasha, he talked about multi-stage builds, and this is what I'm using also. So basically I say, start using the Microsoft ASP.NET Core build image, and that has the SDK, so all the compilers and all the stuff that you don't need at runtime, and name this build environment. Then I start working in my slash app folder, I copy the csprosh file and do a .NET restore. And here you can see that because I can use command line 
tools from the command line interface of .NET, I can just build up my machine as I like. So in this case, I restore all the dependencies for my ASP.NET Core application. Then I copy everything to the working folder, and I do a publish. And this is basically compile and create the application. This will uh, eventually create a DLL, an assembly, a .NET assembly. And then what I do is I say, OK, now start over, but not with the SDK image, but with the runtime image. So this only has st uh, the stuff needed to run ASP.NET application, not to compile, etc. Then I copy everything from the build environment, from the app slash out folder to the current. And then I expose a port, because this is an API. I need to expose a port so I can hit it. And I do some other stuff. Uh, I won't go into this. It's some uh, environment variables that is needed for my application. And then I say, when I start a container based on this image, I want the entry point to be the .NET command, and then feed it the assembly that was just created. And this will give me, when I say Docker run this image, it will create a container, it will start up the application, and it will start the web API in the background. So that is how that works. Um, if I look, for instance, to the time service, which has no API, it's more simple because it only is a command line tool. It's just a, a console application. So the Docker file is a bit different, but the, uh, the principle is the same. And now I use, for instance, the .NET 2.0 SDK image. And when I start for the runtime image, I use the .NET 2.0 runtime image. But it's basically the same. Um, if I go to my Docker um, to the command line, I can see that I have lots of um, images. Uh, let me see. There's lots of stuff in there from some intermediary uh, stuff that I did. These are my own secret commands, but you will get them, no problem. So these are the images that I have on my machine. And as you can see, here's that Ubuntu image that I just talked about, but also the ASP.NET Core build image but also my audit log service and my web application. So all these images are created on my machine. And what I could do now is just start them one by one and say, OK, you start, and um, you listen on port 5100, and you start, you listen on port 7000, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a neater way to do that. And then that is where Docker Compose comes in. So if I go back to my solution, so um, you must imagine that for every um, of the uh, components that is in here, I can build this image. And now I can use Docker Compose, and Docker Compose gives you a format in which you can describe how your application basically look. So what I do here is I say, okay, um, my application has several services. And this is a basic YAML uh, format um, for the, that Docker Compose can understand. And I say the first service that I want to describe is SQL Server. And it is based on this Docker image. And it has this container name. And it has some volumes. I won't, I won't go into volumes yet, but it's a way to make sure that your data stays on the host machine and not in the container. So it survives restarts of the container. That is pretty uh, uh, nice to, <laughs> to know when you start working uh, with this, this kind of stuff. Um, as you can see here, um, I tell, through Docker Compose, I tell that when I start a SQL Server, it needs to um, listen on port 1443. Uh, uh, 34, and the port in the container is 1433, because that's the basic port of SQL Server. And this is basically, uh, um, if you have SQL Server running on your machine, then 1433 is already taken. So this is a way to say, on the outside do this, but on the inside map it to that port. So that's pretty easy. You can set some environment variables. For instance, this is my secret SA password. You can all know that, because it's also up on GitHub. Um, and so forth. Um, also, my RabbitMQ. I take the default RabbitMQ image that has been created by the creator of RabbitMQ. It is just up on the Docker Hub. I didn't create anything. I just say Docker pool RabbitMQ3 management, which means that I get this neat management website that you just saw. Uh, and it's just a container that you start. Uh, the name is RabbitMQ, well, et cetera, et cetera. It has two ports, one for management and one for sending and receiving messages and so forth. Um, the mail server, the same. This is a DJ Forelli. He created this uh, development mail server. It's pretty awesome. You can use it everywhere when you want to do some mail testing. So it's awesome. And that is basically the infrastructure that I need. My SQL server, my RabbitMQ, and my mail server. And then 
I start defining all my own services. I have my vehicle management API. The image that you need to use for that is pit stop vehicle management API, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I define the port where it's running on. I say that when I start this using uh, Docker Compose, it should run as a production environment. And I will show you in a minute that it can also run as a development environment, and then I could do different things. Um, well, the gist is the same. So I define all my APIs, I define the audit log service, the invoice service, etc. And the nice thing about this is, is that when I define it like this, then what Docker Compose will do when I start this is will create a virtual network for me, and it will make sure that all these services that I define, that I can reach them by the host name defined in this Docker Compose file. So, for instance, if I look at my customer management API and I look at the um, production settings, then the, U the host name for my SQL Server is just SQL Server. I don't need to know any IP address or DNS name or whatever. The host name for my RabbitMQ is RabbitMQ. If I want to talk to another API, I can just say vehicle management API on port such and such. So that's pretty cool. And you can do all kinds of funky stuff. You can, you can define the network by yourself. You can do all kinds of segmentation and load other drivers, and that there's all kinds of crazy stuff out there. But if you don't do anything, then Docker Compose will just create a network for you. Um, so what I can do now, I am in the folder where, um, where the Docker uh, Compose file is. So I'm in the root of my uh, solution, and you see the Docker Compose file is here. And now I can say docker compose up. And it will read the compose file and start all the stuff. And you get some really cool logging that is really awesome for demos. So if you want to do, ah, oh, that's OK. Oh, yeah, there's one awake. So this basically starts everything. And I'm doing this in the front so I can show you the logging. But you can also basically run it as a, uh, with a slash uh, uh, of dash D. You can run it as a daemon in the background. Um, and another thing, if you start looking at this stuff, and then we go um, towards the code, what you will see here, I have to look at it here. For instance, the invoice service. When I start it, it gets an error. It says, whoa, I'm error connecting to RabbitMQ, retrying in five seconds. And this is very important when you start thinking about this stuff. So my invoice service wants to start, and the first thing that it does, it will create a queue on the pit stop exchange in RabbitMQ. But in the order which these services are started, it could just as well be that this service is up instantly, instantly but my RabbitMQ is still starting up, or my SQL Server is still starting up. So what you see is that I do a lot of retries and stuff like that in my code, so for instance, if I go to the infrastructure package and I go to the message publisher, that is the one that I can use to publish messages to my RabbitMQ, um, what I use there is poly. And this is how this works. So you basically say, OK, I want to create a policy, uh, handle exceptions. So uh, eventually, it has to execute this. This is basically how I connect to my RabbitMQ. You don't have to look at all the code, but this is what happens here. So I basically say, execute this. When an exception occurs, I can also say when a specific exception occurs or whatever, then you need to wait and retry. Do that with a time span of five seconds in between, so wait five seconds and retry. And if after nine retries it still doesn't work and I get another exception, then it will rethrow the exception. But this, for instance, is enough to make sure that the invoice service gets the error, and then five seconds later, it will just try it again, and it is started. The same goes for going to your database. I've created this, uh, this solution that when I have nothing on my machine, and I just boot it up, I just do Docker Compose up, it will create the databases for me either through code first, migrations using Entity Framework. Um, I've built one of the services using Dapper. You know, it's, it's you, you have the choice there. You have to choose what's best for the service and what you want to do. So, um, well, the cool thing about this is um, what, you, what you can do here is you, start, you can start testing. So if I go to the same folder, what I now can do, for instance, is Docker Compose uh, stop the customer management API. And what it will do is it will stop the container. So if I do a Docker PS, you will see, oh, Docker PS, if you can type. 
you see all the Docker images running, um, but the the stop one, uh, let me see, customer management API, here he is. He just exited 11 seconds ago, so it's not running on my machine. If I now go back to my web application, and I go to vehicle management, it's up and running, of course, but if I go to customer management, there is also a retry. So it retries a couple of times to call the API in the back end. If it doesn't uh, um, uh, react, I will get an error page stating that, okay, customer management is offline. You can do customer management now. Um, but I can do workshop management. And this way, I try to also make kind of vertical, so the customer management module within this application belongs to the customer management service. If that service is down, only that module of the application is down. And this is something that you have to design. That's not something that you get by doing microservices. So that's really important to remember. Um, the nice thing about this is um, if I now also stop, the, for instance, the audit log service, So it is not running now. So the container has been stopped and no audit log will be uh, created. But the nice thing about this is, is that if I go to my solution and I pick the audit log service, this is now a Visual Studio code or a Visual Studio solution. I open it up in Visual Studio. And the audit log is just an, a console application. So when it starts, it gets, am I running in production or am I running in, uh, in development mode? It adds some configuration from the config file because I need to know how to connect to my RabbitMQ, et cetera. But this is just a simple application and it only just picks messages up from the bus and puts them somewhere on the file system. Well, the thing I can do now, um, this will actually use the audit log handler and this is the very complex um, code that you need to uh, put the message into a file. What I can now do is just say, okay, I'll put a breakpoint here, and I'll put, I'll just press F5. And then it will start running the application, just the .NET Core application. It will connect to the RabbitMQ as development. And when I get no, now go to the application, and for instance, I, well, I just schedule another maintenance job from uh, 12 to uh, one, change, uh, wipers, whatever. And now I can see that the message gets received by the audit log service, and I can just step through it and do all the stuff. And I can do this with every single service that I've created. So not the SQL Server and RabbitMQ, of course, but all these services, I can run them on my machine. I can also run multiple. So if I want to say, oh, I want to know how the customer management service and the workshop management service work together, I can just start these up and do all kinds of debugging. I can just pick up messages from my audit log because the audit log service in development mode will just drop them in C, dev, audit log. And this is just plain uh, JSON. So this is the message. It has a job ID, it has a start time, it has an end time. This is all human readable. And I can just pick this JSON up go to my RabbitMQ, put it in, and just send it as a message. So it's really um, awesome for uh, troubleshooting or stuff like that. Any questions so far? Yeah, okay. Yes, that's a very good question, and that is the question to ask. What will happen when your RabbitMQ goes down? Well, I will show you the picture, and maybe the answer is in the question. All hell breaks loose, and everything stops. Yes. Yes, it's a single point of failure, so you have to cluster that or uh, make sure that, you, that, that, thing, that thing doesn't go down. So, um, like I said, you have a couple of... Um, uh, nice things that you gain from working like this, but you also have uh, a couple of challenges that you have. So you need to make sure that your messaging is up and running, or you need to be able to detect that uh, certain messages get lost or whatever. So um, these problems you still have. That's, that's no, um, there's no guarantee that you, don't, that you have done. Answer your question? Was another one at the front? So let's look at some code, how I built this. 
It is not very exciting stuff, you know, it is just basically uh, ASP.NET, but I think a couple of things are nice to, uh, to show. Um, like I said, the customer management API is just a basic ASP.NET Core web application. Um, it just uh, uses uh, entity framework, so it has uh, a DB context. Um, nothing special here, I won't go into that. Um, the controller is just a web API controller. So, um, if you look here, I use, make use of the dependency injection framework that I get for free with, uh, with ASP.NET. Uh, I inject the DB context and the message publisher. And of course, I set this all up in my startup, and I will look at the startup uh, a bit later. So I can get a GET request on my API, and it will just get the customers and do a two-list async. And the nice thing that I've also done for all the APIs that I have within the application, I've used Swashbuckle, and it will generate Swagger for me and a Swagger UI. So when I go to one of the ports, for instance, localhost, and I have to, I thought this was vehicle. Yes, this is vehicle management because uh, customer management is down. You know, it's in maintenance. You saw these guys now working on it. Um, if I go to the application, I can just use uh, Swagger so I can get the, the description of the service and create a client, for instance, or a proxy class for that. Uh, I also can test it here. So if I say, give me the list of vehicles, I can just get an HTTP 200 and I see the information that's in the service. So that's pretty cool. Um, what I have to do for that is, if I look at the startup, for instance, for this application, um, this is just plain stuff. It, you, you, you search on the, uh, uh, on the documentation of Swagger. You have to add something, add Swagger gen. You describe your uh, API. It supports versioning and stuff like that, so that's really cool. And also, that's something that you really need to think about. Do I need to support versioning of services if I want to run multiple versions at the same time? Um, do I need to support versioning of my messages and stuff like that? So those are the challenges that you gain when you start looking at this kind of uh, architecture. Um, and here, then, the Swagger UI has been added. Um, like I said, um, if you look here, for instance, um, this is the DB context, and I make sure that it can be injected in my class, and this is the uh, RabbitMQ message publisher that I used for uh, publishing messages to RabbitMQ. And it's a standard MVC application. So nothing really special here. Um, like I said, the events are defined within the services. So this is the service that generates a customer uh, uh, registered event. It is just a plain old C-sharp object and I can new it up and then send it to RabbitMQ. And I need to make sure that I send it as a plain JSON uh, string, and I need to give it a header message type. That's the only thing that I want from my, from my clients. And then when I send the message, every other uh, system that wants to do something with this message, they can just create a queue on the RabbitMQ and um, get these messages. And because there is no .NET type information or whatsoever in there, you can just ingest this message um, deserialize it any way you want. So you could support versioning or you could support uh, default values or whatever, and then uh, start working with that. So that's the customer management API. Um, a more interesting one is the workshop management API. Like I said, the customer management and vehicle management are just CRUD operations, CRUD um, services. But the workshop management is divided into two parts. We have the API and there's the workshop management event handler. First, the API. Uh, no, let's do the, uh, the event handler first. The event handler is also a console application. It runs as a separate Docker container on my machine. So I could just temporarily take it offline. Then messages that are sent through the broker will be queued. And once it comes back online, it will ingest these messages and work uh, um, on the read models for this, uh, for this service. It is pretty simple. It is just a um, console application, like I said. It does the whole configuration thing. It needs um, RabbitMQ to uh, receive messages. It needs access to the database, so it has a, re uh, a, um, a repository. And it also does the retry stuff to make sure that we initialize the database after SQL Service up and running. And then we start the event handler. And the event handler is where the magic, magic happens. So it basically 
it gets injected the message handler in the DB context. And when I start it, it starts the message handler. And there's a little trick in here because this message handler is built in a way that it says, OK, I will look for messages on the RabbitMQ. Once a message comes in, I will call the message handler that you give me when you start. And so if I say message handler start, I pass in myself because I implement I message handler callback. And that is the way I get the messages. So this is the, met the method that gets, um, that gets called. It gets the message type, and it gets the message, and that is plain JSON. And one of, the, uh, uh, one of the choices that I made here, and that is something that I'm still thinking about whether or not that's a nice uh, thing to do, is that I have created a, an enumeration in my infrastructure package with all the message types. Because I'm an architect, and most of the time, I'm responsible for the quality of my system. And I have been working on systems that had developers that said, hmm, this is a nice event. It does almost what I like. You know what? I'll create a copy of that, and I name it something weird, and then put my extra fields in it or something. And before you know it, you have a plethora, plethora of, of messages going all around. So you need some governance on that. And you can do. Um, yeah, really complex about that, but I just said, okay, I have an enum, and this enum is the only message types that I will support. So that's an idea. If you have a better one, just do a pull request because this is all open source. Um, but when you get a handle message async being called, you get the message type. And this is really simple stuff. What I do is I create a J object, so I don't really know yet what the type of the message is. So um, this message deserializer is just a utility, service, a utility method that I created that uses the same JSON stuff, so the, the JSON formatting stuff. Then I have a J object, and then I say, I just do a switch. What's the message type? If it is a customer registered, then I can cast it to the right uh, type and call handle async. And handle async is then a private method that says, okay, uh, if a customer registered event comes in, I'll just do some logging. In this case, I put it on the console, but for a production application, you would use something like semantic logging or whatever. And the only thing I do is just put it in the database. So this has become really simple code. Uh, there is some error handling in here, um, but it's not really that complex. And this way, you can actually create uh, a listener on events. And whatever you want to do with these events, it's up to you. So it's um, pretty clear. OK, um, another thing that I want to show you is the workshop management API, because that is a bit more complex. And that is the last thing I want to show you. Because here I've used domain-driven design-like stuff. So I thought, OK, in my workshop management domain, there's the, there's the bulk of my business logic. I need to be able to make sure that, for instance, I have three engineers. And I cannot do more than three cars at the same time then. So all these kinds of checks I need to do. So for that to happen, I created the domain. And the domain is, um, has a workshop planning that is basically my uh, aggregate route. And it has all kinds of checks. So for instance, when I get a plan maintenance job command, I start checking all kinds of stuff. So here I check my invariants, my business rules. Do I have more than three? Uh, um, uh, jobs at the same time, etc. And this can grow over time. And one thing that I found very um, important is that this class is not tied to anything. This is just a plain old class with some, um, with some uh, logic in it. And everything that I need from the outside is either injected, but it's, uh, if you know the onion architecture or the clean architecture principle, that is what I've used here. So this is basically a thing that's, that I say, I can new this up, and then I have an aggregate. It has an ID. And when I, for instance, plan a maintenance job, then it will check the invariance. It will create a maintenance job planned event and will handle this event. And why I do this is that once I have checked all my invariants, I'm sure that this command can happen, and then I handle the event. As you can see, this domain class doesn't know anything about RabbitMQ or sending messages to the broker. Nay, what it does is when I handle workshop planning created, I'll just return the events that are the result of this action. And 
This is a trick that I use because sometimes when I send a command, multiple events will be emitted. Multiple things will happen and I want to be able to tell that to the outside world. In this case, I will just return a list of events. That's the only thing that I do. And then my controller that actually calls this, so if we look at, for instance, the register, this is executing the business logic. So I say planning.create, and the events that come out of that, I save that to an event store, and I emit them to the bus. So everybody that needs this information can, um, can do something with that. So this is a way for me to make sure that if I want to unit test this, I can just take this class, I'll give it some events, and the events that come back, I can do assertions on. That is one way I could test this. So that's also a pattern that I, uh, I used often. And the event store, if you look at the, um, the database, for instance, the event stream in the database is really simple because it's just, basically it's just the ID is the, the date because uh, my aggregate has an as ID the date of today because I have a workshop planning per day. It has a version based on how many events I already got and it has an event stream. And this event stream is just plain, uh, just plain JSON. I will do this trick, let me see. Oh, a lot of windows open. Oh, no, that's the wrong one. So this is just JSON. So this is the first one. It is the workshop planning created event. This is the ID of the message. That's just the technical ID, and this is the date, which is also the ID. The next one is maintenance job planned for this vehicle, for this customer. And this is something that I'm still working on because now you can get into the discussion and if you went to Adam's talk this morning, should this only be IDs or not? So this is something that I'm still working on. Okay, what kind of information should I put in an event? What kind of information would I need? And if, if there's one thing that you take from this talk, start designing this deliberately. Don't think, oh yeah, it's, it's, it's just a bus or it's eventing. No, you have to design this because this will bite you in the ass if it doesn't, uh, doesn't work out. Okay, um, back to the slides. So to wrap up, um, if you look at .NET Core, it is really nice friends with Docker and you can do lots of fun stuff with it. But this is, for me, a way to work with this application on my development laptop. Like I said, if you start looking at production scenarios and if you want to run in the cloud or do stuff with orchestration and A-B testing or zero downtime deployments, you have to start looking at Kubernetes or Docker Swarm or stuff like that. So that's, uh, um, that's something that's not in here. But for a developer, I have actually was at a company that they said it took them about a week for a new developer to ramp up. They had to install all kinds of stuff on the development machine, and then there was all kinds of grief with uh, environment variables and stuff like that. And now they just say, okay, get me from the repo and get the information and do Docker Compose up and they are up and running. So that's pretty cool. So it can really help you with your DevOps and stuff like that. It can really help you to uh, be productive fast as a developer, but there's also lots of caveats that you have to look into. Um, these are some, um, some resources. Uh, there are a couple of books that I've read that I think are really great. The book by uh, Sam Newman, Building Mi uh, Microservices, is also a good book if you don't do microservices. There are lots of uh, great, uh, great patterns in there. Microsoft has, an all, has, a, has a whole library with all kinds of stuff around um, uh, architecting .NET Core and .NET applications using, um, using Docker and doing stuff with the cloud. And, this is the third book basically about domain-driven design, and I think it's a really good book, Patterns, Principles, and Practices of Domain-Driven Design. So if you have a rainy Sunday, just pick, what, pick up one of these. And then basically this is the place where you can get my code, so it's up. And in the GitHub page, there's a really extensive description of what I've just told you. So people have been telling me that they had it up and running in about 10 minutes on their laptop. All you need is Docker uh, for Windows. So if you want to play with this, if you want to have, um, if you want to do some pull requests, if you want to join working on this open source uh, thing, be my guest. 
Uh, and without further ado, and I think I have some time for questions, thank you for listening and uh, have a great last day.